Take your Bible, if you will, and turn back to the book of Isaiah. In this Advent season, we've been looking at some of the fifth gospel story as Isaiah has been described as the fifth gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but of the Old Testament. And we've looked at the popular passage found in Isaiah chapter 7, that a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Isaiah 7, we know that one. But the backstory we were not quite familiar with. We looked at Isaiah chapter 9. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. A passage we know, but the backstory we're not all that familiar with. Out of the darkness of this backstory emerges the glorious gospel message, the light. These gospel stories that we find throughout interwoven in the prophecies of Isaiah designed to bring God's people with a sense of expectation out of their darkness into the light, into the light that God was calling them to, a light that he had called them to. And yet they wandered in darkness for so many years. We come to Isaiah chapter 11 this morning, a passage that you may not be as familiar with because it's not one that you easily Remember, but certainly it is in that Christological line that is in that line of passages that we find in the Old Testament in Isaiah's prophecy that speak of the coming of Christ over 700 years before his coming. And what would be the statistical probabilities of Isaiah speaking in such numerous ways concerning the Messiah who would come? It would be virtually impossible for these things to occur unless, in fact, they were miraculous indeed. For any one of them not to come true would be a dismissal of all of them. But the fact that all of them have come to pass in the first advent and some of them still remain for the second advent or the second coming of Christ is for our observation today. Isaiah chapter 11, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. We said, what does this have to do with Jesus? And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Again, Isaiah reminding God's people of old, calming their fears, challenging their faith, helping them to understand that there is one who's coming who's greater than the king whose authority you live under now. It is not King Ahaz. It is not the Assyrians or the Syrians or the tribes of the northern kingdoms, kings that you have to be fearful of or that you need to stand in awe of. No, it's this king of glory. It's this king who is going to emerge. It's this promise to them that out of this darkness will emerge this time of light. And so Christmas, in a very real sense, is a time for us to remember the promises concerning the coming of the King. It's a dilemma for many pastors as we come to this time of the year, wondering what are we going to preach that people haven't already heard? I, trust me, I'm in forums and talk with pastors and think, what, do, what are we going to say at Christmas that people haven't already heard? Well, if you're saying something that people haven't already heard, there's probably something wrong with your message. What am I going to say other than Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of these Old Testament prophets? That's the story, and that's the story we will keep telling until we see the return of the King, until we see the second advent, the coming of Christ again. And so it's a story we know well, but it's a story that in so many ways we don't understand completely because we've not invested ourselves in Scripture and because some of the Scripture that Isaiah speaks of and the prophecies that Isaiah speaks of, he speaks of something that has yet to occur. And so he anticipates the first advent, the first coming of Christ. But he also envisions a time when the Messiah, the Christ, will come again and he will establish his throne upon the earth. This is what Israel was wanting. This is what they were waiting for. This is what they were longing for. It was in the fullness of times, Paul writes in Galatians, that Jesus showed up on the scene. He came forth, the Bible says. 
Literally, that's what the word means here in, in verse 1 of chapter 11. There shall come forth, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. It will spring forward. This is going to be something wholly different than the kings that you've been accustomed to. He will be different. He will be extraordinary. You will not be in the same line of the kings that you've seen who've come and gone, whose hearts never turned to the Lord, with exception Hezekiah and Uzziah and some of the kings. But for the vast majority of these kings, their hearts were not turned toward God. And yet they were in this Davidic promise that had been given to David, that in the, from the throne of David, from the lineage of David would come forth these kings. And from this lineage eventually would come forth the one true and living king, Messiah himself. 2 Samuel 7. And so it is in this keeping that Isaiah speaks that he's going, to, he's going to come forth. And he has rather humble beginnings, doesn't he? Because the Bible says, go back to chapter 10 and verse 34. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with an axe. And Lebanon will fall by the majestic one. He's describing his what the Lord is going to do, that the Lord is going to destroy the Assyrians. He's going to cut down. The Assyrians are compared to a vast forest. And they're going to be, virtually, they're going to be cut down. And, and that's going to be the end of them. We looked at that already in the prior chapters. He talks about how he's going to bring them to nothing. That while God has raised up these Assyrians, and this is very interesting, that he raises up a foreign nation to bring his people under submission because his people won't hear him. He uses pagan people to bring his people to their knees. I mean, you need to follow that historically and biblically because it's a pattern that God uses using nations to bring his people to their knees so that they will repent and turn toward him. And so he's going to eventually take the Assyrians that he's allowed to emerge in power and authority over the world at that time. He's going to eventually take this country that he's allowed to come in and bring his people to a place of discipline in their life and judgment. And he's eventually going to destroy them. They are a tool in his hand. And he's going to annihilate. He's going to cut them down like trees in a forest. But what will come forward is this one this root or this twig from the stump of Jesse. So this stump of Jesse, the, 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 the lineage of Jesse and the, and the lineage of David, that there is this stump that exists. Imagine this imagery, right? There's this stump and emerging from the stump is this small little growth that doesn't look like it's much. And the point is this. Isaiah's trying to make that Messiah will have humble beginnings, he won't look like other kings that you've seen. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 53, let me read a few of these passages for you so that you understand the nature of his humble beginnings. Isaiah says this concerning Jesus, Messiah. For he grew up before them like a young plant, like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty with that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, Isaiah 53. I could be teaching and preaching from Isaiah 53 today. Typically, we'll look at Isaiah 53 around, around Easter time because this is this prophetic passage concerning who is he? He doesn't seem to be like much. He doesn't, that's, that's what Isaiah is saying. He doesn't appear to come in grand, in, in grand fashion like kings of old, but he has these humble beginnings these humble beginnings. And while God is in the process of putting down human governments, he's in the process of raising up his divine kingdom. And so he's going to cut down the forest, the Assyrians. He's going to raise up his own people. And while his people will go into exile for a number of years in their life, he's not through. He's letting them know that God has a promise. Don't give up on it. There's light penetrating the darkness, that this light that's come to your darkened world is going to, is going to happen. It's going to take place. And so this Messiah is going to come forth from this very darkened world. He is, what he says in, in, in chapter 10 and verse 34, that... He is the majestic one. This one of humble means is majestic. He's someone to be wor worshipped. He's someone to be honored. He's someone to acknowledge. He's extraordinary. He's different from all the rest of the kings. 
And when you look at the genealogy in Matthew concerning Jesus' life, it seems like a whole list of people that seem rather obscured until Jesus shows up. Until Jesus shows up. So this humble beginnings of Christ's kingdom, he is fit to rule is the point of what Isaiah is making. He is fit to rule. This one of humble beginnings is precisely the one that we know will fulfill the scripture. This one of humble means is the one who's precisely the one that we should follow because of his humble beginnings. A twig, a shoot from the stump of Jesse. And then he says, in verse 2, we look at the compelling power of Christ's kingdom. What, what do we see this compelling? Notice the reference to the Holy Spirit over and over in verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Jesus himself refers to this passage along with another portion in Isaiah. When he talks about the Spirit of the Lord is, is upon him, what was he saying? This, the idea here is that he is one who's come with the anointing. That's what a, the Messiah means. It means the anointed one. Christos, the, the, the Greek term for it. He is the anointed one. That is the spirit of God is upon his life. It will be evident to those who watch and see him. The spirit of the Lord is going to characterize his life. He is the anointed one. And while other kings have disappointed, this prophetic king Jesus would be everything that they would need. When you look at the description, there's a sevenfold description we don't have time to get into at length here, but I want you to see this in verses two and following. He will be endowed by the Spirit. He will possess true wisdom, not the wisdom of this world, but he will possess hokama. It's this idea of he will, he will possess all wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and he will have the skill wherein to administer all things appropriately. And, and we'll see this in terms of his justice and the way that he makes his rulings. And so he will possess true wisdom. He will be grounded in, in the fear of the Lord, in the fear of God. In verse 3, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. There's this longing in, 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 in Jesus' heart, Messiah who comes. What will characterize him? He will have a fear. He'll have this relationship with the Father, which will be unique. It will be unique and will be divine, in fact. And he will be perfect in judgment. So the idea here is the compelling power of Christ's kingdom is that he will be anointed by the Spirit of God. What characterized Jesus' ministry? When others saw him and they listened to him, people who normally would have nothing to do with religion. In fact, they were nauseated with the religion of the day and the legalism of the day. What was it, that, what was it about Jesus? John's gospel tells us that what characterized Jesus' life is that he came in truth and in grace. There was an anointing of the Spirit of God in his life. People who were caught up in bondage and, 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 and were being misled, they were being now set free because the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jesus. And he was ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit in relationship, in perfect harmony with the Father. Look at this. In the Old Testament, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all working together. It's as though it's been a divine orchestra of some kind, right? Yeah, you got it right. It's exactly that's the case. And so he's uniquely qualified as the one who is here to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. And so we see the compelling power of, of Christ's kingdom. But also I want you to see going forward the supreme justice of Christ's kingdom. The supreme justice, his delight will be in the fear of the Lord. Notice verse 3, the second part of it. This is very important. He shall not judge by what he sees, he will not decide disputes by his ears alone, by what his ears hear. What, what is the point? If, you don't, if you're not judging based on what you see and what you hear, what measure of judgment do you have? What standard of judgment? What capacity for judgment do you have apart from what you see and what you hear? That's basically all that a judge has, but not this king. The compelling power of Christ's kingdom, we, we see, we see the, the supreme justice of Christ's Kingdom. He will judge flawlessly in righteousness. Notice in verse 4. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor. And it doesn't mean that he's going to bring judgment upon the poor. This is not the idea. In fact, go, go back to Isaiah chapter 1. You've you got to see this. Because this is something that you will find throughout the prophets. You can argue with it all day long, but I'm just telling you, those who are disenfranchised in our society, those who have been, the, the system has, turn, has been turned upside down on them, have never been given a chance in this life. Isaiah is interested in this. 
He's interested in justice. He tells him to learn to do good in verse 17. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice, get, guess who? To the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Why was Isaiah interested in this? He was interested because invariably when the system goes astray, when the system is turned upside down, when men's hearts are turned away from God, they will do the most atrocious things to one another. We have the capacity to treat each other in such harmful ways. And the people who, are to tend, who tend to get the brunt of it all are people who are fatherless, the widow, those who are oppressed, those who have no voice for themselves, the unborn, you got me here, who have no voice. Nobody, how many politicians today run from speaking for the unborn? How many? He's saying, Isaiah's saying, God's going to make this right. And those who are oppressed, he is very interested in people who are being taken advantage of. By the way, you take advantage of people, you got to know this. You know who's on the side of the disadvantaged and those who've been oppressed? God Almighty is on the side of those who've been, who've been taken advantage of. So the next time you take advantage, I remember not, it was several years ago, one of our widows were going down, I won't tell you what dealership, but they were going down to a dealership to, to buy a car. And uh, so I called that dealership and I, told, I, talked to, I want to talk to the salesman. This person is coming down to talk with you. I want you to know right up front, she's a widow. So I know you can make money on a lot of people, but I'm asking you not to make money on this widow. By the way, we're sending one of our deacons with her. So you, you just need to know, and, by, and just on top of that, I'm not, I'm not threatening you. I'm just letting you know that you're, what's about to enter into your sales office is not an ordinary customer. We're talking about a widow, someone who could use a help up. And I said, so when she sits in your office, I want you to know that if you treat her right, God is going to bless the rest of your sales. You make your money somewhere else. Don't make it on her. That's what I told him. And we'll send a deacon along with him, with her. And that's what we did. Because you don't take advantage of widows. You don't take advantage of the disenfranchised. You don't take advantage of those who are poor. Poor by what estate? Because they didn't want to get up and work? No. And that's not it at all. It's because they didn't have the opportunity. Look at the opportunities you and I have received in our lives. Do you know there are people all around us and people all around the world who haven't had the same opportunities that we've had? And you pull yourself up in the morning and think, my, what I've achieved. And so much of it has to do with the circumstance. And I know God's gracious, but we have been born into so many things. And so many, so many people haven't been born into those things. We ought to take note of that, right? Before we spend a fortune on a lot of people and not on those who could use it the most. That's why we give to money to missions. That's why as a church, we give money to missions so we can share the gospel to people all around the globe, to people that don't have anything. That's why you pick up the shoe box and you send a little box around the world to someone who when they receive that little gift, it may be a little dollar, whatever it is, it's the one little thing that they may ever receive that year. And you bless them by doing that. They won't know your name this side of heaven. Oh, I could just go on. But I want you to know this is, very, I'm passionate about this because Isaiah's passionate about it. He's passionate about it because of the, of, the, of, the, of the nature of the rule of Christ. The nature of the rule of Christ. So we see the supreme justice of Christ's kingdom. He will not just see things as you and I see them. He will not just hear things as, as you and I hear them. He's not some judge in a courtroom who listens to people debate their, you know, the pros and cons and put their, forth their case and do all those things. Listen, you'll stand before the judge and he knows it all already. He knows. And you can't, and you can't fool him. And so he will not judge by what he, but what, by what he sees. And so there's this flawless nature of the, the one who's going to come. So the supreme justice of Christ's kingdom, the idea, okay, just step back for a moment. What is he saying? Isaiah is saying there's coming this one. He's coming, a light in the darkness. He's coming. He's this little twig. He will amount to what appears to be not much at all, but he will emerge into something incredible. He will be unlike any king we've ever had in our history. He is the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's going to assess and see life differently. He's going to judge life flawlessly. He's going to see life fairly in everyone's regard. And he's going to demonstrate what it means to be faithful. What it means to be faithful. That's the word that he, that he uses here. 
But with righteousness he will judge the poor and, he, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. It's the word ruah. It means, it's, it means literally just the, his breath. When he speaks it, it's going to happen. His judgment it will be true. And he will kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his wa- waist and faithful, faithfulness the belt of his loins. These are the things that are going to characterize him. He will govern with justice, with justice, real justice. This portrait of a divine one, not some mere mortal, not just some mere human being, but the Messiah is coming as divine, as the God-man. The king would judge by the standard of absolute truth. Why will he judge by this standard? He would judge by this standard because he delights in the fear of the Lord. Jesus, his relationship with his father is perfect. He delights in his father. The father delights in his son. The spirit anoints the son for the purpose of coming and serving as king. So that he may serve as unlike any other earthly king. He comes in this fashion. He judges with an absolute truth. There's never a moment in which he makes an assessment about something that, that it isn't so. The way he sees it, it's always that way. He, he, every, anytime he observes it, anytime he makes an assessment about something, he judges it, it's always that way. Because he's perfect. He is supreme in his justice. And he governs with that justice in mind. The fourth thing I want to say is this. There's the total peace of Christ's kingdom. The imagery is beautiful, isn't it? Look at the prose that we find here in in Isaiah chapter 11, beginning in verse 6. Notice this. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard, talking about the time when Messiah comes. And you're saying, wolf will dwell with the lamb, okay. And the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together. And a little child will lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze together. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. A lion eating straw like the ox. What's he describing here? The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. You ever put your child over the hole of a cobra? Let him play out there and just say, oh, he's going to be okay. Don't worry about it, honey. Yeah. Maybe some of y'all see a spider and say, get that child and pick him up, right? We're not going to let our child play like that. What is he describing here? Let me keep reading it. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. This is God's peace. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. What is Isaiah talking about? He's describing a time when Messiah comes, not just at his first advent. Isaiah seems to be looking now beyond the first it's like he's on his toes and, and he's getting a vision and he sees the messiah is coming and he's getting this vision and he's writing this down and he's recording this so that he has this understanding that this king is going to come and and he doesn't understand the distance between the first advent of christ and the second he's looking from this perspective and so he sees the two of them almost as though they are the same event but when you turn them sideways they're not the same event There's some distance between them. He just doesn't quite see that, just like we don't quite see it and understand it. It's that perspective that we have on this side, reading Isaiah's words on this side of when they were written. So Isaiah sees the first advent of Christ, but we are able to understand that between the first, the the, the already, and the not yet, the second coming of Christ, that there's this period of time that we are living in. It's this period of tension that we, like Israel of old, we live in this time of waiting, don't we? We're just like them. We're waiting. We're anticipating. We live in a darkened world. We're praying and desiring and hoping and, 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 and working toward a more righteous place to live, and yet it seems as though the harder we work toward those things, the more and more we see unrighteousness prevail in our, in our culture, in our society. We see the injustices. We see the oppression. We see all these things, but Isaiah says this, that there's coming a time that this one who, has, who will come, he, he, the Messiah who will come, will establish a reign and a kingdom upon the earth in which even the animal world, the predatory world, will cease to be predators. They'll no longer look for prey. 
That's the description. In other words, he's describing a time of a kingdom which is to come, in which all things are going to be made right. That's the place we're looking for. Christmas reminds us that this isn't it. We're not there yet. We long for and desire. We believe. We anticipate. We know that he's coming. We don't know exactly when he's coming, but when he comes, we want to be ready for that time in which he will set up his kingdom on this earth. Revelation 20 describes this millennial reign of Christ, this time in which Messiah comes again. Revelation 19 actually describes when the king will come again and he will, he will set up an earthly kingdom upon, uh, uh, in this world and from that place he will rule and reign upon the world and he will establish a place that he always desired to be just like the garden, a place before the fall. And so in these, in these terms that he's giving us, and there's a lot there in these, in, in these poetic words, he's letting us know it's going to be a time of great peace. It's going to be a time of human flourishing. It's going to be a time when we're no longer at odds with each other. And nations will come and they will inquire of the king. That didn't happen at his first coming, but it will happen at his second coming. We have that perspective that Isaiah didn't quite have. It doesn't mean we're better than. It just means we're, we've lived a few thousand years later, right? 2,700 years later, we have some perspective in light of what Isaiah actually wrote in Revelation that we have. And so the total peace of Christ's kingdom is, is, is amazing. In, in the incarnation, uh, uh, Isaiah 9, we see that the nature of the incarnation that a virgin shall conceive and bring forth the son, right? And you shall call his name Emmanuel. But there, then there's going to be this time, not only of his first coming, the incarnation, but the time of his second coming, the realization, the actualization of all that Isaiah spoke of. It's going to happen one day. That's God's future for our lives. He said, well, that's fine. That's then. What about now? The purpose of understanding the future, God's preferred future for our lives, is so that in light of the coming of Christ, the actualization, the realization of Jesus coming, setting up his earthly kingdom, and making all things right when, in fact, they've been wrong for so many, the, 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 the fact of us knowing that will help us to live differently now. That's the purpose of it. Not just simply long for a better day for me, but to work for a better day for you. That how we live and how we treat each other here and now and how we, how we address one another, how we address those who are oppressed and so forth, it means something. It means something, how we treat one another. And ultimately, God wants us to live in light of eternity. And so that, that day that he describes in verse 10 for the earth shall be full of the, of the knowledge of the Lord. There's coming a time when, when the world will know his name collectively will inquire of him will have a greater capacity to understand who he is he will be here and there will be this fullness of knowledge that will exist and then in verse 10 he says in that day the root of jesse who shall stand as a signal or banner for the people of him shall the nations inquire and his resting place shall be glorious in that day the lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant he talks about, he's referring to in that day. That day is that second coming of Christ in which he establishes his kingdom. And in that day, these things are going to occur. And, and then he goes on to give a very lengthy description what's going to happen. What, what he says is that in that day, I'm going to, from the, really for the four, four corners of the earth, I'm going to call my people back to me. I'm going to bring them back. Israel, remember Israel, who'd been taken captive by the Assyrians. The Babylonians would take the southern kingdom, Judah, captive in 586 B.C. They, they would be taken captive. They'd be scattered. They would be abused. They would be just literally everywhere, just about everywhere, by the way, today in the world. You can find remnants of the people of God, the people of Israel. You can just find them just about anywhere in small groups of people. He's describing a time when the Lord, in his sovereign plan, in his, with a, in his sovereign hand, he's going to bring his people back together again. Not only will he bring Israel back together, but he will bring those of us who are not Israel in terms of our ethnicity, but we, we, are, we have been grafted into God's plan, according to Romans 9 through 11. Then in the last days before he comes back, there's going to be great persecution 
And this great persecution ultimately will culminate in the Lord Jesus Christ settling all things and bringing his people back. This is a big picture, isn't it? It's a big, this is Christmas. <laughs> I didn't bargain for that. Give me a baby in the manger. Well, you got that too. But there's something more glorious even than even a baby in the manger. Yes, it's humble beginnings. And we see the total peace of Christ's kingdom. And lastly, I want you to see the extensive reach. How, how wide is this kingdom? It's comprehensive. All of these who are surviving, and, and we'll skip down, just skip down to, to verse 16. He describes it, and there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant that remains of his people as there was for Israel when they came up out of the land of Egypt. So he said he's going to do something for the second time. Now, what is he describing? He's describing a new exodus. There's going to be a second exodus. From where? He says from Assyria. But he's describing how God's people are going to come really from all over. But, 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 but literally this, this movement of God's people from the northeast all the way back into the land. He says they'll be walking. Whether they will be walking or not, I do not know. But it's a description of God's people traveling back, coming back to the land. Who would have ever imagined before 1948 that Israel would return back to the land? Who would have ever thought it for hundreds and hundreds of years? Bible scholars didn't even take that into consideration. It was outside the realm of human possibility. How could it be? How could all these people come back to this land? And yet they've been coming back. And they will gloriously come back to the land in this reign of Christ upon the earth. He's talking about the second advent of Christ. We celebrate the first but we consider the second. We consider the second. Because if we, un, if we celebrate the first and we don't consider the second, then we miss the fact that one day we are going to stand accountable to the one true and sovereign God of all of creation. Amen. And the one that can raise up in Assyria and then cut her down like a forest of trees is also the same one that can allow us to emerge and then at the end, we would be cut down because we rejected him. If you reject him, you don't have anything. When you die, you know what they're going to do? I just want to put it to you simply. They're going to get a U-Haul trailer. They're going to back it up to your house. Your family's not going to want to go through all your junk. Just, I got a bunch of that in my shop. I've been trying to get rid of it. Thought, no one wants this. Those little sentimental things you've been holding on to, or whatever you got, they're going to throw them out. They may keep one or two, you know, whatever. And it's like, I want, to be, I want this to be really raw for a moment, okay? They're going to pull that U Haul up at $39.95 a day, and they're going to carry your few little belongings away, and the rest of it they're going to put out at the street. And you, as you were born, you would die. And you're, wow, pastor, that's good news. <laughs> if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, all that God ever promised and wanted for his people to live in a garden, in a paradise, in a beautiful place where righteousness, fairness, and faithfulness of our God is experienced, that's what he wants for you. You just have to believe. You have to believe. And I mean you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. John 1, 12. And if you will call upon his name, he will gladly save you. Why do you suppose he came? He came to save us. To save me. And I am eternally grateful. That is our king. And he is wonderful indeed in all that he has ever desired for us. He will recover us. This is the remnant. He will recover us. I love that word in verse 11. He will remember us. He will redeem us if we believe. But you've got to believe. 
Lord, you're, you're gracious. You're good to us. We thank you for this. And we worship you. There's no one like you. I know there have been times in our lives, Lord, maybe for some of us, long seasons of our life, where we just ignored you. We didn't give you a second thought. But today it's different. You have caused us to consider your greatness. You've caused us to think about you, to understand you more deeply, to inquire of you. You want to redeem us. And I pray, Lord, that our hearts will be open to that redemption. You have remembered us. You have not forgotten us in our sin. You not abandon us. And we love you for this. We give you our hearts, our lives. We dedicate our, our homes to you. Lord, you are, you are great. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.